The Venture Brothers has, from the beginning, been a show that posited that growing up is somewhat of a disease. That we live happily as children until one day, the real world shows up, and all the happiness drains as we become boring adults. But in the world of the Venture Bros, this is shown not to be the case, where the most miserable characters are the ones who lose their earlier attachments, while the happiest ones are those who took their childhood with them into their adult life. The show parodies assets from the old Hanna-Barbera library explicitly to draw this comparison. Every character being totally original would lose a lot of the meaning, and so we see pop culture being drawn on repeatedly in order to create a sort of framing around how our media is shaped by the real world, and then how that media goes on to shape us. And sure, not every character gets to have a happy adulthood as some of the traumas we bring with us from our youth can linger and make it difficult to let go. It can be hard, if not impossible, to separate the good from the bad, and more often than not, it's even harmful to attempt to do so. Just because some old show you used to love has a ton of issues doesn't mean you can't still love the show for what it was or how it made you feel. I think The Venture Rose itself is a prime example of this concept. Dr. Girlfriend began the show as a trans joke. Look at this loser whose girlfriend has an Adam's apple type of gag, only to later on become one of the most well-realized characters in the entire cast. And The Venture Bros is a show with a very well-developed cast. Made more amazing by the fact that it's a nearly two-decade-old show, and one would have expected less depth to the cast as they got flanderized and simplified over time. And maybe the best way to start talking about the movie is to start talking about the characters. Oh, and one more thing. Major spoilers ahead. I am not going to do a recap of the movie to start with, and I will assume that anybody watching this video has seen it already. If you haven't seen Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart, or The Venture Bros for that matter, I definitely recommend watching it as I think it's possibly the greatest television show of the last few decades. The big one to focus on at the center of the whole plot is Mantilla, or Deborah Majeure, the daughter of Fourth Majeure and Bobby St. Simone, who would later go on to become a double agent for the OSI. As the daughter of Force Majeure, she's technically the true heir to the Guild of Calamitous Intent, although when David Noe took over, she not only lost that life, but also lost her ability to live normally afterwards. While her mother was able to open up an animal sanctuary, she was cursed slash blessed with her mother's invisibility. This ended up forcing her into the sidelines of mundanity, where she spent the next few decades plotting to get what she believes is her birthright scorned by the fact that she could never live up to the expectations the world had on her shoulders from the time she was 10. Sound familiar? Mantilla is obsessed with the past in this regard. She clings to it and fights to bring things back to the way she believes they ought to be, bringing Dr. Miss Councilwoman the Monarch along with her as she believes that the two are similar, and this is a partial truth. It's not a secret that old cartoons sidelined women very commonly in their narratives, Woman existed either as eye candy or some sort of damsel to be rescued, and then won as a prize, often both, and Deborah has internalized this so thoroughly to the point that she's incapable of moving on from an idea of how things used to be. In her mind, she cannot succeed in a man's world, and this would have some credibility if not for Dr. Miss Council, I'll call her Sheila from this point, if not for Sheila's existence. Because while Sheila was born into roughly the same world as Deborah, she's managed to make a name for herself. She works alongside the Monarch, not as a number two, but as a partner, and their marriage is constantly shown as one of the true wholesome relationships in the entire series. They need each other, and they're happy to have each other. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, but to a person poisoned by past injustice, it might not come across that way. Deborah thinks of Sheila as a victim, that she's forced to number two for an incompetent man despite her clear abilities, and she wants to liberate her from that life. But it's not something that she needs to be saved from. Sheila has long since rejected the role of a victim or a damsel in distress, and grabbed a satisfying life for herself. She's happy in a way that a person hung up on the past could not possibly understand. But Mantilla can't solely be compared to Sheila. Another extremely apt comparison comes in the form of Rusty Venture, the original boy adventurer. Both were children with extremely high expectations placed onto their shoulders, who spent most of their lives trying to capture what they feel they were owed by the world. But we saw Rusty overcome this hang-up throughout the first half of the show, eventually moving on from trying to follow in his father's footsteps and becoming a much more self-made man. This is something that Mantilla clearly could have done if she'd only set her mind in the right place. She's extremely talented with anything tech-related, and her 20-year scheme to create her own villain organization had enough potential that would have been better unleashed in basically any other way. Because she never let go of the past, she could never move on to the future. 
Mantilla would have made an impeccable villain, easily a level 10, but she never wanted that. Ironically, had she tried so hard not to emulate her father, she could have become so much more than him. Of course, her name is Mantilla, and to mantle is to adopt another's role, in addition to being a name for a hooded garment that she wears. So perhaps it was always inevitable she would turn out this way. Speaking of characters who are compared to Rusty, Malcolm, or the Monarch, finally has his origins revealed to the audience as a clone of Rusty Venture with a little bit of baboon DNA mixed in to offset male pattern baldness. Hence, the name of the movie. The baboon DNA is attributed as the reason that the Monarch hates Rusty so much, although it's much more likely to be a series of small misdeeds poured over the initial inciting incident that causes the true hate. Like when you dislike somebody so every tiny thing that they do becomes obnoxious. And that initial misdeed surfaces as a callback to one of my favorite sibling dynamics, Jonas Jr. and Rusty. We've seen that the two are potential arches for one another back in Season 3, that nothing can be more personal than trying to thwart a person who's basically a better version of yourself. And the guild recognizes the potential in a rivalry of that nature. The Monarch hates Dr. Venture because the Monarch hates himself. And he's said this as much before. In fact, if you look at every time he gets the chance to talk directly to Rusty to call him out, Every single complaint he lobbies towards the guy is something he fears about himself. He's looking in a mirror, and the Monarch hates what he sees. But this is all with good reason. The Monarch is a better version of Rusty, not just the 2% baboon DNA, but in how much he's made out of how little he's received. Sure, the Monarch is a trust fund baby, but he still never really knew his parents, and Rusty is THE Rusty Venture, given a life of travel and comforts while his clone gets pawned off on some couple left to fend for himself. So why wouldn't he have some kind of resentment for the favorite child? Now I'm probably reaching for this next comparison, but I can't help but draw a link between the monarch's value and the resentment that must have been felt when looking at other adult cartoons as success compared to the Venture Bros as a show. Almost anybody who watches the Venture Brothers can and will tell you how amazing it is. The show is smartly written with characters who are all worth analyzing on their own, and a setting that not only makes so many callbacks and references, but is actually elevated as a result of these. The amount of love and care put into a single episode of the Venture Bros blows almost everything else out of the water, and this isn't something that I say lightly as a kind of guy who's wasted a year of his life over analyzing media properties. So to put your heart and soul and blood and sweat and other various body fluids into an amazing work of art and have it overlooked and mistreated compared to, and I'm not naming names, a specific other adult animated comedy, actually several, would likely lead to at least some kind of resentment. But as I said before, this is me reaching for some kind of comparison. Personally, I doubt that Doc Hammer and Jackson Public are so petty as to have this sort of resentment for anything else. I think they both made a show that they're extremely proud of, and that they'd prefer to have it speak for itself instead of existing in the shadow of another body of work. Either way, the answer to the age-old question, why does the monarch hate Dr. Venture, is not an extremely satisfying one. It basically boils down to, he is just like that. But is it really so devastating that we never got a proper answer to every single question we have? Half the fun of the Venture Bros was in the realm of speculation, to be able to discuss with other people online why you think certain things happened. For example, a lot of people wonder who was responsible for the Movie Night Massacre. Personally, I find the evidence to point to Bud Manstrong. He wanted to watch Sharky's Machine, but wasn't old enough, so he snuck into the projection booth where he came across the Blue Morpho blackmail tape, and wound up being so... enthralled with the filth that he opened the bay doors by mistake, flinging hundreds into the vacuum of space. This also explains his weird sexual hangups and arrested development, while also putting characters into places where we already knew they were. But then again, there are still so many theories out there that to shut down all but one basically means the discussion is over. The Venture Bros will become a cult classic in a few years' time. I've never been more sure of anything in my life. It does not lose fans unless they die, and it only grows more popular as it gets recommended through word of mouth. So for the discussion to continue on indefinitely means that the fandom can continue to speculate and discuss things beyond surface level aspects that a first time watcher is noticing. So the Venture Bros becomes better by not answering every question or putting to rest so many theories by giving them endings that ask more questions than they answer. So I've covered some of the more conclusive character arcs, but what of the lesser stories? Not every character got to have some sort of flawless resolution. It was a 10 episode season contends down to about 80 minutes after all, so a lot of the cats got relegated to the sidelines. Brock Samson gets very little development in the movie, but what really was there for him to do? Ever since he got over his crush on Molotov and met Warriana, his character growth has all but stagnated. 
He's a bit bored with his job guarding Doc again, but he loves his new family so much that it's an emotionally satisfying job if not a physically satisfying one. The triad gets dreadfully little screen time. Al gets about two lines of dialogue before disappearing completely, but those two lines were fine for a character who would have had to have a new story set up and then wrapped up in such a short amount of time. I do appreciate that the showrunners realized just how little Blackula hunting Jeffers in Twilight ever got to do. Despite how little time there was to work with, we got multiple scenes going into his history, and then a big fight scene as he saves Dean and Orpheus. Considering Brock did not get a big battle scene, but Jefferson did, it kind of feels like a little bit of justice for the Triad fans that makes up for so much lost time. Gary's story arc sort of wrapped itself up at the end of Season 7. Just as Sheila has done before, he gets the chance to go off on his own, only to reject it as the life that he ended up with as one that he loved, even if it's not a life he voluntarily chose for himself. Billy and Pete are basically relegated to exposition dumps for the help pod launch and subsequent failure. They haven't really had much in terms of development since St. Cloud gave them their first arching experience, and since then have more or less just been dragged along for other adventures. Not that I'm complaining much. It's a much preferable aspect to the two buying a cabin out in Spanakopita and disappearing for good. But the fact that St. Cloud himself only vaguely appears in the title of an in-universe YouTube video kind of makes their whole rivalry take a backseat to anything else. They were never major players anyway, so it makes sense even if it, like so many other plot lines, is kind of disappointing. A lot of characters in the OSI have also stagnated in terms of what they're doing beyond that point. Hunter Gathers hasn't really served a role or had an arc surrounding him since Operation Prom. He's basically exposition dumped by this point as well, but that's fitting for the head of a spy organization. There's not too much he can really do, unless we get another sex change operation followed by some soul searching about OSI's history and future, but then again, longtime players of the Super Spy game aren't really too bothered by this sort of thing, and it would have rehashed too many of the plot points from Brock's arc back in Season 2. Other characters who have been relegated away from the main plot of the movie kind of include Dean. While he's very motivated to find his brother, he doesn't really do too much other than come along for the ride. There's a teased bit about Dean becoming a black vampire, which that would have made for some hilarious racial comedy, but ultimately went nowhere. I think it did serve as a good means of drawing comparison to his previous mental states, though. How else do you show off the importance of a family relationship other than to have a character undergo some sort of ordeal without the guidance of their other half? If Dean and Hank hadn't have had a falling out, then Dean 100% would have told Hank about the Blackula bite as soon as he noticed it, and the two would have gotten into each other's head about it, like the Apaches are back moment from Assassin Annie 911, but with just a little bit more hilarious racial naivety. Sometimes, the stories we aren't told can tell us just as much about the world as the stories that we are. Like Hank's tale, pieced together from his schizo journal entries across his developing multiple personality disorder. As I stated at the beginning of this video, The Venture Bros is about how the media we consume shapes the media we create, which others then consume to continue the cycle. And yet, as much as we allow these aspects of culture to shape who we are, there will always be some part of us that yearns to exist outside the sum of what we've seen on TV. And if any character represents that, it's Hank Venture. He's terrified that deep down underneath all the things he mimics in his head, there really is nothing. How much of Hank Venture exists outside of Enrico Matassa, or Russian Gajovic, or The Bat, or whatever other persona he's adopted that day? Outside of that, he's just a Venture, and outside of that? In the end, he worries that his connections are all that he has to him, and he wrongfully seeks out another one to learn of who or what he is supposed to be. Hank returns to his supposed mother, as if that will lead to self-discovery, but self-discovery isn't made by escaping who you are, but embracing it. In the end, Hank Venture is a Venture. It's not the life he wanted to choose, but it's the life that he has, and there's nothing wrong with that. He can have love and passion and emotional fulfillment alongside his brother, just as much as Dean struggles to find some sort of fulfillment without his twin. We still have a few unanswered questions remaining, but more surprising than that are the few that we actually got. If you told me that the Venture Bros movie was going to stealthily drop a whole Brick Frog character backstory, I would have believed you 100%. Of course, that's exactly the type of thing that Public and Hammer would drop on us instead of a full Monarch origin story. For those who missed the freeze and you miss it bonus, he previously worked with a brick maker who kicked him out to develop something stronger than bricks. So Brick Frog adopted the brick as an art form and has been waiting for the day that he can strike fear into his now nemesis who doesn't appreciate the form of solid rock or concrete or whatever bricks are really made out of. As much as The Venture Bros is a show that benefits from not answering questions, it's also a show that gains a lot of mileage out of answering ones that we never needed. 
Henchman Zero didn't need to make a comeback, much less two of them, and yet we got some great stories out of that. The propensity to turn random throwaway lines and throwaway characters into developing jokes, and even whole storylines, is why the show is so great in the first place. Literally, anything could be important. Just as much as anything could be unimportant. In the very same still frame that we saw Dermot haphazardly throw the orb, a possible super weapon, onto the floor of his filthy bedroom, we also got to see Hank unknowingly holding the birthing pod that he was created inside of. A throwaway object being vital, and a vital object being thrown away. We also never really get confirmation as to who is the mother of Rusty Venture, only that he's a clone in the same vein as his sons, and that their mother was an egg donor. But considering the movie's ultimate conclusion of choose your family, I think it's reasonable to posit that Rusty was simply a clone of Jonas Venture Sr. from the beginning. We've seen that he gets around, a lot, with various women, and yet there's never a huge crowd of mothers demanding child support. There's a hint of this from Dr. Quim being implied to be the daughter of Jonas, but then again her mother is also shown to be attending a swingers party, so it's just as likely that Jonas was only a potential father. If he takes his own advice completely literally, then it makes sense that he would choose his own family, as in guarantee his only offspring are carefully curated clones of himself. So this is as literal an interpretation of the lesson as you can take, with Jonas refusing a ball and chain to hold him back from his super science adventures until he's ready for a protege, the rusty venture he wants to groom into the super science business. Other characters also end up picking their own morals in this vein though. As much as we would all like to choose our own families, sometimes that is a luxury. Trauma gets passed from generation to generation in this setting, and as simple as it seems to cut a toxic influence out of your life, what they put you through is something that will always exist. Rusty wants nothing more than to reject his father's upbringing and head out on his own, whereas Mentilla wanted nothing more than to embrace her family's traditions. But we don't always get to pick and choose what parts of childhood we take with us into adulthood, only how we react to them. And I've said it before, it's not the life you might have wanted, but the life that you end up with and make the best out of. Deborah is able to lure the monarch into Arch by promising them the ability to undo mistakes in life. But as we've learned time and time again, it's the imperfections and complications to our stories that make them worth telling. I think that if you always got exactly what you wanted out of life and managed to live that perfect what-if situation, you would have just as many regrets as you do now. Hank and Dean also end up realizing that their stories are complete even without the closure of learning about their mother. Because Hank and Dean's conclusion as of episode 1 was exactly correct. They don't have a mom. Even if their mother had had more of a biological relationship with them, it doesn't matter. It's not who gives birth to you, but who raises you that makes a parent. Deborah wasn't there, she had no idea they existed, so she's not a mom in any sense of the word, but the one that matters technically the least. Now for a few final thoughts. These are at the end because many of them are subjective rather than analytical. It's basically just me fanboying for a little bit. Despite knowing the showrunners had to cram 10 episodes worth of story into a few minutes, I'm still glad that they kept in some of the casual banter scenes, like arguing over what several means. It really helps to sell the setting and character dynamics a lot more, giving us a closeness that implies that they've worked together for years. Despite how short the movie was, the fact that it took so long to really get going didn't distract at all, and I'm glad they had the self-control not to rush things even though they had every reason to do so. Because they really did have every reason to do so, it still managed to feel pretty rushed at the end of it all. I understand it's through no fault of their own, the show is a victim of a corporate tax write-off, but the movie could have easily been reworked as an All That and Gargantua 2 style setup for a full season. Reworked the Triad and Dean plots to follow a longer trail left by Hank, culminating in their arrival at the Animal Sanctuary. We could see a bit more of the product launch from Vintech, and leave off with the building getting suspended in the stratosphere. There was definitely a space left behind the gaps of what the story could have been, but it's for the best that they concluded the series instead of trying for a to-be-continued sort of cliffhanger. Doc Hammer and Jackson Public have mentioned that they were never going to do an ending to the Venture Bros, at least not in a sense that you felt like you watched the ending. To paraphrase, they were never going to turn out the lights in the bar at the end of Cheers. You'd watch the finale and be able to imagine where everyone's life is going to go from there. Nothing conclusive, but then again, old cartoons were never that conclusive. You always had to have the standard, on the next episode of the Venture Bros, Escape to the House of Mummies, Part 3, sort of hook. There's always more show. There's always more life. And there's no such thing as a happy ending, because there's no such thing as an ending. I said it earlier, but this show is destined to become a cult classic. Just because we're not getting anything new from the series doesn't mean we're out of conversations to have. 
50 years from now, when all the people who are teenagers staying up on a school night, watching adults swim in the family's living room, listening desperately in case your parents were coming down the hallway with a verbal warning to go the hell to sleep, are now old and retired, let me dream, you'll be able to go up to any Venture fan and hold up your hand in a two-finger salute. And I'll look up from my wheelchair, I'll stare back at you, and I will shout, Go Team Venture!